Well, welcome back, folks. Happy Friday. We made it through another week. I um, hope everyone's okay and you're doing uh, everything is uh, well with you folks. Um, just one quick note before we get started with the uh, material today. Uh, I apologize. I didn't realize that I did not post the chapter 13 material for you. Um, and so when you uh, were doing, uh, I get when you were doing the work yesterday to finish up the set A from chapter 13, you weren't able to get that done. So I apologize for that. I posted the chapter 13 material for you already. Uh, and I, I pushed the date uh, for the um, set A from chapter 13 till Monday. So please make sure you take a look at that. Practice working on those calculations, those conversions involving the pressure units that we talked about yesterday. And, um, you know, come by and see me. I, I think those are very st simple, straightforward calculations for you to do. And so um, <clears throat> I don't think there should be any issues there. But um, Please feel free to come by and see me if you have any questions. Uh, drop me an email if you, know, you can't make that time, and then uh, come by, uh, and then we we can arrange a, another time for you to come by and uh, get that extra help. Okay. All right. So we left off yesterday with the discussion of uh, how we can measure gas pressures. We use we can use the, a barometer to measure the gas pressure, and obviously nowadays with technology the way it is, we we have digital devices. We have other ways that we can measure. Um, uh, pressure. And so when we measure pressure, then the unit, uh, the, remember with all measurements, you have to have a, a number and a unit. And so the magnitude obviously is going to be based upon the unit. Um, and I gave you an example of uh, where one of those units are, is derived from, and that, that unit of millimeter of mercury is derived from the actual uh, mercury dish that we use, the mercury barometer that we use to, to measure the, uh, the atmospheric pressure. But more importantly, I showed you how that pressure was measured using a mercury dish. Okay? And so make sure you keep that in mind because when we talk about this idea of, of uh, the atmospheric pressure pushing down, pushing down on, on everything around us, uh, everything around it, uh, that's going to be important, especially when we start talking about liquids today and how, um, how for example, the vapor pressure of a liquid is, is formed okay? and how evaporation works. And so the atmospheric pressure, as you move forward, it's going to be very important. When we talk about the pressures exerted by a gas, we, we compare that to the atmospheric pressure. And so make sure you understand then that when we talk about atmospheric pressure, it's the pressure exerted by the gases that are in the atmosphere, the gases that are around us. Okay? And so we will um, uh, compare that pressure to the pressure that a, a gas exerts in a chamber and so forth as we move into chapter 14. But you have to understand that concept of atmospheric pressure, and then make sure you you uh, um, are able uh, you're comfortable with uh, the different ways that we can describe pressure in the different uh, for the different units. Make sure you are able to do that. Okay? And then prior to that, then we talked about <clears throat> the situations in which we um, there is no gas pressure, and, and I wanted to bring that up uh, as a uh, as before we started talking about how we can measure gas pressure, because it's important for us to remember then that. Um, Gas pressure is, is a result of the, of the gases, first of all. But the gases have to be moving. They have to be moving and they have to be colliding with each other and colliding with everything else around it in order for, the, for us to experience the gas pressure itself. So gas pressure is a result of the gases. And so obviously the gases have to be there. And that's the whole idea behind masses. If you have a situation in which there are no gas particles okay, and there is no mass of the gas, uh, and thus the mass of the gases would be zero. So if the gases aren't there, you have no gas pressure. That's, that's the whole idea behind a vacuum. But the second key factor and critical factor is that the gases have to be moving. And that's where I want to pick up with today. If the gases don't move, so you can have gases, but if the gases don't move, they don't collide with one another. And if they don't collide with one another, if they don't collide with everything else around them, they don't exert a force on those objects around them and each other. And if they don't exert a force, they don't exert any type of pressure. And that's what I want to pick up with today, folks. And make sure you keep this in mind that as we move forward, and uh, I want to try to uh, speed things up a little bit, we, we spent a lot of time on discussing uh, how gas pressure forms. That's going to be important. And, and that's why I want to focus on this. But I'm going to start picking up the pace here a little bit and try to finish up with this chapter, hopefully by next uh, Tuesday, uh, next Wednesday. And so we can go ahead and start chapter 14. And, and just be, uh, just uh, remember folks, you won't have a separate exam on chapter 13 
Uh, the exam will be on chapter 13 and 14 together. And I promise I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll post the chapter 14 material. I'll, I'll do it today after lecture. That way you'll have it there. Okay. Uh, and then I'll, um, yeah, so let me make sure that um, you take a look at that. Okay. All right. So with that said, then we said that from this equation, we saw this, we, and I derived this equation for you that pressure is a result of force okay, and how the, the force of an object and how that object interacts with another object over a certain area in order to form then, in order to form uh, this pressure, okay? All right, so with that said, what we're examining here, make sure you keep this in mind, folks, what we're trying to look for here, what we're looking at is how does uh, the, the movement, the movement of an object, so um, affects pressure. So when there's no motion, okay, there will be no pressure. Okay, so we said that in the first instance where there is no pressure is when there is no, there are no gas particles, no mass. Okay, so we saw in that first instant then that the if we take a look at Newton's second law. Okay, so let's uh, substitute in Newton's second law here. Okay, whoops, sorry. We substituted Newton's second law here. So Newton's second law here allowed us to see then that when we have uh, no mass, and we saw this right, when there is no mass, when there's no mass here, then there would be no pressure. Okay, so when mass is zero, there'd be no pressure. And so we're not examining that. We're trying to examine here where motion uh, comes into play. And so if if motion here is being mentioned, if M is mass, okay, M is not motion, folks, M is mass, the motion part must come from this variable right here. Okay? And so when if we saw that when M is zero, when there's no mass, force here would be zero. This force would be zero, pressure would be zero. Okay? So therefore, motion is not a little, big A down here is area, the area of contact. That, that doesn't relate to motion. So therefore, the variable that contains motion has to be that one right there, which is acceleration. Is acceleration. So let's go ahead then and let's uh, substitute that in. Okay. So it's this part here. If that is zero, if that becomes zero, no motion then means if a if uh, little a is zero, then pressure will also be zero. So you can have a gas with mass, okay, but if it is not moving, then it's going to be uh, the pressure then is be zero. So how then does acceleration then account for motion? Okay. Well, acceleration we said then was the change in velocity. Change in velocity, folks. Velocity, remember, is speed. Okay, so let's make sure we remember this. Okay, the velocity then. This is this represents then the speed of an object. There it is. There's the motion, and specifically it represents the change in speed. Okay, so it's a change in speed, and that's what acceleration is. So if the velocity is zero. If the velocity is zero, that means the zero speed. So if the if v then is equal to zero and the units are meters per second, if the object is not moving, okay, when there's no motion, the velocity is zero. <coughs> Excuse me. When the velocity is zero, okay, when the velocity is zero, this will be zero. Delta v would be zero. And if delta v is zero, a is going to be zero. If a is zero here. The whole numerator is going to be zero, and then pressure will also be zero. Okay, so let's keep this in mind then. Let's go ahead and substitute that in. It's going to be delta V over T. So I went ahead and substituted, substituted in the expression delta V over T. And again, delta V over T is going to be a change in velocity. But if the velocity is going to be zero and it doesn't change and it stays zero, because remember, when there's no motion, uh, the, the velocity will constantly be zero, be constant, uh, uh, be zero, and it doesn't change. Okay? And so if that's the case, then this whole expression on the top here will be zero. Okay? And so therefore, the, the pressure will also be zero. Okay? And so there, we have mathematically shown then how then if an object is not moving, then it will not exert any pressure. Okay? So when an object is not moving, the whole numerator is going to be zero. So if that's going to be zero, pressure is going to be zero as well. Okay. So make sure you can follow through with this, uh, uh, with this um, 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 th uh, mathematical uh, explanation for why pressure uh, is related to, to motion. Okay. And so the question then is this. Okay. We, we saw then with, uh, in the first case, when, the pressure, when there's no gas pressure, we saw then uh, when we have a vacuum, there is no mass. So in this case then, when is uh, when when does a gas particle no longer move? Okay. Is there a condition in uh, that we can observe here where the gas particles 
stop moving. Okay. Well, <clears throat> to answer that question, let, let me go ahead and um, uh, bring in this, this factor that um, when the temperature is at absolute zero, now this is a point that I said then that uh, we can observe, but we, we really can't. This is, an, uh, this is a theoretical point <clears throat> uh, in which uh, the temperature then drops all the way down to zero. We saw back in chapter three that at absolute zero, that is the lowest temperature that we can get. Okay, absolute zero then, and let's make sure we remember this, absolute zero represents then a temperature that is equal to zero, not zero degrees Celsius, but zero Kelvin. Okay. Zero Kelvin then represents the lowest uh, temperature. And when the absolute temperature is going to be zero, and then this is what we refer to as being the absolute temperature. When the absolute temperature is zero, that is when we have no more motion. Okay? And so that's when all motion ceases, uh, uh, both at the macroscopic and the microscopic level. So it, I pointed out that uh, this, uh, can we observe this? No. I mean, this is a theoretical point that we cannot get to. Uh, there is an interesting, uh, really interesting video that was done by NOVA a few years back, probably quite a few years back when you, you folks were still very young. Uh, but it was a very good uh, document that uh, uh, tried to trace the, our efforts as, as trying to get to absolute zero. Man's, uh, uh, our, our, our effort to try to achieve this temperature here. And, um, and really interesting things happen to uh, particles as they get closer and closer to absolute zero. So I would uh, highly suggest that you watch that video. It's a very well done video, but uh, it's very informative uh, and, and it's very interesting for those, for those of us who are very interested in, in say, for computing or for some other practical applications, just to, for uh, the, uh, the oddity of it as well. Okay. But like I said, this is a theoretical point that we, uh, we cannot get to. So, uh, but as we get closer and closer to it, we do notice then that the, um, the pressure of a gas starts to get lower and lower. And so when we talk about Charles' law in chapter 14, we're gonna see then that we can, we can trace back, we can extrapolate backwards uh, on a graph and see then that at, at some temperature that is equal to zero Kelvin, the pressure then is gonna be zero. And so that is the, um, uh, that's the hypothetical point that we can get to where there is no more gas motion. Okay, so let's go ahead and examine this fact a little bit more. Okay, so we saw then that there is a direct relationship between motion and and temperature. Okay, now I want to I want to continue with that discussion by taking a look at then how that motion is related to temperature and how that motion is related to uh, another form uh, of energy and how that motion is related to energy and how that energy is going to be related to heat energy. Because remember, uh, well maybe uh, you're not aware of this, but temperature is a measure of heat. Okay. So temperature is a measure of heat. Okay, so let's go ahead and make sure you, you write that down. Okay. So temperature basically is the measure of relative heat. Okay. Measure of relative heat. Okay. Okay. Uh, and so it's not a measure of actual heat energy, but it's a measure of relative heat. So therefore, when you are at zero degrees Celsius, uh, relative heat energy, and I'm sorry, I should say that. Relative heat energy, because that's going to be important. Okay. So we can say then that when the temperature is at zero degrees Celsius, there's going to be less heat energy there than when the temperature is at 100 degrees Celsius. Okay? And so temperature is not a measure of heat itself. Okay? It's not a measure. Heat is energy, and heat is energy, but it's a measure of relative heat energy. So we could say then if there is, uh, if you were in a room that is at 100, uh, 20 degrees Celsius, it's going to be a lot warmer, has more heat than in a room that is at zero degrees Celsius. And so temperature is a measure of heat energy. Okay? And then <clears throat> we saw then, and I want to put this out to you, we learned this at the very beginning then, that we had a form of energy known as kinetic energy. Okay? Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. Okay? It is the energy of motion, and it measures, uh, it, it relates the motion of an object um, uh, to a form of energy. Okay, so we were able to define then kinetic energy as being then with this equation would be related to mass and this term again, the velocity squared. So for an object to have this form of energy, for an object to have kinetic energy here, for an object to have kinetic energy, okay, it has to have mass, but it also has to be moving. Okay, and so if an object is moving, it has, it has kinetic energy. Okay. And so what I'd like to do is let's, let's examine this relationship then between the motion of the object and kinetic energy, which we already know, 
and the motion of an object and temperature. And how then does kinetic energy relate to temperature? We just saw then that if an object, there is a relationship, and I'm gonna go ahead and write this down now up here. Okay, there's a relationship between uh, uh, the uh, motion of an object, the speed of an object, uh, of a gas particle, and its temperature. Okay? And so, um, and, and temperature that I'm gonna put here in uh, parentheses represents heat energy. So therefore, there's a relationship between heat energy and the speed at which these particles move. We know then that there's a relationship between the speed of an object and kinetic energy, which we see down here. And so can we establish then a relationship then between kinetic energy and heat energy? Okay. So we want to be able in this slide then to trace the relationship, the three relationships here that I've, I've pointed out to you. Okay, let's go ahead then. Let's uh, let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so we have here in this chamber a uh, some gas particles. We have an example of gases. So these are gases floating around. So these are gases. These are gas. This is a gas sampler, and these are gas particles moving around. So these gas particles move around, and that's what's being uh, uh, emphasized here. They're, they're moving around this chamber in a random, rapid, and constant manner. Okay. And what I've done then is we've placed a thermometer here, okay? And so at this particular point, the thermometer reads a certain, at a certain level, and this represents then the temperature of the gases inside. So remember, this is a sealed chamber, so we're not measuring the temperature of the air outside. We're measuring the temperature of the gas particles inside here, okay? All right, so what we're gonna do then in this particular uh, example here, then is we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna take a, um, we're gonna take this gas sample here and then we're going to heat it up, okay? Now, <clears throat> I want you to notice here what we're doing then, we are not taking the uh, thermometer, we're not uh, taking the heat and applying it directly to the thermometer. It's not, the thermometer is not being held right directly above the heat. And if you notice here, uh, the thermometer is still separated. We're heating from below this chamber here. So we're adding heat energy. We're adding heat energy into this particular chamber here. Okay. So as we continue to add heat, heat energy, okay, um, I would, uh, I would uh, ask you, if I had a chance to ask you, what do you think would happen to the reading on this the thermometer, which is measuring temperature? Remember, we're measuring the temperature here. This is temperature that's being measured by this thermometer. Okay. What happens to this thermometer as we start heating up the gases inside this chamber. So let, let's keep this in mind. The thermometer is not being held directly into the heat. Okay. The thermometer is being separated from the, the, the flame down here. So the flame and the thermometer are still separated. But what does, um, you know, what, what we are doing is we're heating up the gas particles in this chamber. Okay. So let's take a look at what happens here. Okay. Let's take a look at what happens. Okay. So, what we do notice is, and we notice then that the temperature does increase. The thermometer increases here. Okay, so we see then that the temperature goes from a lower level and it moves up to a higher level here. So the temperature does increase. Okay? And so the question then is, why does the temperature increase? What's going on inside here that causes the temperature to increase? Okay? Well, let's take a look at what happens to the gas particles here. Okay, so the gas particles, what we're being shown here is that it looks like the gas particles are starting to move faster, represented by these longer arrows. And, and you can kind of see this here. You see these gas particles are starting to move faster. Okay? And that's what we're having. They're still moving in a random, rapid, and constant manner, but they're moving at a faster rate. So therefore then, and we'll call this uh, the, the condition number one. Okay, so before, we'll call this condition number one, and this condition number two. Okay, so the before and after. So before heating, we'll call this velocity then V1. The velocity of these gas particles before, and then this will be the uh, velocity of the gas particles after. And what you notice here then is that V2, the velocity after heating, is greater than the velocity before heating. Okay. So the speed after you start heating is going to be greater. Where did that come from? Well, let's consider this here. Let's consider this here. If we know this, okay, well, if we know that velocity is related directly to kinetic energy, okay, so we can say then that what is true then is that these particles here have greater energy. Okay? So the kinetic energy after heating will be greater than the kinetic energy before heating. And so with that said then, looking at the temperature here, okay, what can we say about the temperature? The temperature 
after heating is greater than the temperature before. So if you notice here, there is a relationship that we can trace through here that as the velocity increases, the kinetic energy increases, the temperature increases, and so that's what we have here. So as the velocity goes up, okay, and so we can say then that the velocity and temperature related here. So as the velocity goes up, the temperature is going to increase. But there is a direct relationship between velocity and temperature here that we can trace right here. And where do, um, and how can we um, uh, explain that? We can explain that by the use of energy. We have added heat energy here. So heat energy, heat energy, and or, I'm sorry, uh, uh, let me erase this a little and I'll finish up here. Heat energy is being added. So this is heat energy. Okay. That's being added into here. And what happens is that heat energy is being absorbed by the gas particles here, and they start moving faster. Why? Because they are in, uh, their kinetic energy is increasing. And as their kinetic energy increases, their, uh, their speed increases, and then that's all a result of that added heat energy. So we can't observe the energy exchange. We can't see the heat being added. We can't see the gas particles moving faster, but what do we observe? We observe the change in temperature. And as the temperature changes, we know then, based on what we, uh, our analysis here, as the temperature changes, then we know then <clears throat> that the kinetic energy is gonna be increased. Okay? And so this is what we need to be able to trace then, because we cannot observe kinetic energy. We cannot observe the movement of the gas particles, but we can observe a change in the temperature. And so as we observe the change in the temperature, what we need to keep in mind then is what's happening and then is that the kinetic energy is changing, kinetic energy is changing, and if the kinetic energy is changing, the velocity is changing as well. Okay. All right, so with that said then folks, <clears throat> yeah, um, I know that uh, we're, we're kind of moving a little bit slower here, but that's okay. Th these are very important concepts for you to understand. Not uh, not only so you can understand the, the, the nature of gases, but be able to trace the relationship between macroscopic observations, and that's, we can observe this, we can observe temperature changes here, we can observe temperature changes, that's on the macroscopic level, but we can take that now and explain what's happening at the microscopic level, and that's fundamental in understanding how, how uh, chemistry works and how science works in general, okay? And so make sure you keep in mind then that the reason why I'd like, I, I, I'm, we're spending this time on this is, uh, and I've mentioned this since the uh, beginning of our classes, you have to be able to make these observations, be able to explain your observations based upon the behavior of very, very small particles. Okay? And so this gives us a perfect opportunity in order to practice that skill. Okay? All right. So with that said then, folks, have a good weekend. Uh, I'm not making anything.